Hare Krishna. So thank you very much for coming today for this retreat. And I'll speak on the topic of how to have loving exchanges with each other. And I'll give a little background. <coughs> Recently, in the last few years, I've been traveling across the world, but I've been talking with devotees who are doing counseling, They're not just counselors, but also devotees who have some professional counselor training. I have a few of them. I met some people who are into, who are counselors for in general religious groups, either an interfaith meeting. And one of the things which struck me is several devotee counselors also told me that what we need very much for growing spiritually, growing together as a community is a stronger and deeper relationship among each other. In fact, there's a great need within the devotee community also for warm heart-to-heart -heart exchanges. And what happens is that in some ways when you start practicing bhakti, our lifestyle and our the way of living becomes significantly different from that of the rest of the world. <coughs> so, when we don't share many of the things that we sh that most other people are doing, then what we do we can share only with each other, with other devotees. In fact. Many people come to Krishna or come in general to spirituality for a sense of community, for a sense of belonging to a broader, bigger community. And Shri Prabhupada in the Nectar of Instruction writes that the Krishna consciousness movement is nourished by the sixfold loving exchanges. So, which are these six exchanges? Which are the exchanges? Yes, hearing confidentially and speaking confidentially. These are primarily related to the speech. Then? Yes, giving prasad, yes, giving food and taking food, prasad. And lastly? Giving gifts, giving, gifts, giving, gifts. giving gifts and receiving gifts. Yes, thank you. So now, at one level, this might appear to be very simple. Yeah, what does the Bhakti Sam, the Uddesha say? Shadvidham Preeti Lakshanam. So now when there is love, affection, or kindness, any emotion that is there in the heart, how do we come to know that that emotion is actually there? <coughs> I was recently at Massachusetts University and I was speaking on the uh, yoga of the heart. So there was a question asked by a student. He says, what is the proof that God exists? So I said, okay, before that, what is the proof that your mother loves you? What do you mean? He says, no. He says, what is the sign? He said, he was asking, what is the scientific proof that God exists? Said, okay, what is the scientific proof that your mother loves you? Yes. Can you get a loveometer and put it in your mother's heart and see the reading over there? Oh, you really love me. <laughs> so, explain that different things need to be proven in different ways. If I say right now, the timing in, time in India is 7 o'clock or 7.30. Now you can confirm it. Maybe you can just ask Google, you can go on a global watch time. Right? So there is a way to confirm it. If I say right now, the temperature is so and so, you can check it. There are certain parameters, certain things which can be objectively quantified. And that quantification can be verified. But there are many things which need to be inferred. We cannot objectively quantify them. And love is one such thing. It cannot be quantified. We, we can't have a love meter because love is not a mathematical quantity. It is real, but it is not mathematically measurable. So it needs to be inferred. In, just like we can infer, how do you know my mother loves me? Well, when I was sick, my mother was awake all night taking care of me. Whenever I ask her for something, she's always there to help me when I need her. So by, by, by 100 incidents in my life, 
I can infer from them that my mother loves me. But this, these are inferences. So we cannot mathematically quantify. So, so similarly, whenever we need, so when it said, Shadvidham Preeti Lakshana. Lakshana means it is a characteristic. So we may care for each other, we may not care for each other. But it is whether what, what is there in our heart, how will people come to know? It is through <coughs> the way we act. I was recently at the memorial of a devotee. The devotee had passed, a very wonderful devotee <coughs> in Mumbai, part of the Radhavagnar community. <coughs> so many devotees <coughs> spoke about how that devotee had appreciated them, had helped them in their spiritual life, assisted them, encouraged them. How wonderful that devotee was. So after everybody spoke, then Radhanath Maharaj, the spiritual master, leader of the community over there, so Maharaj said, I also spoke a few words about that devotee. And then he said that all of you spoke so movingly, so wonderfully appreciating this devotee. Now, how many of you appreciated him when he was alive? So, we often have appreciation within us, but we don't express it. And what happens is, it is there in the heart. Everybody needs understanding, everybody needs encouragement, everybody needs appreciation. But when it is not expressed, then it is not even known that it is there. So, what we are trying to do is that, uh, when we have a loving exchanges, we'll be focusing on primarily <coughs> The two which are not talked about so often. And as far as giving prasad and taking prasad, we do it abundantly. <laughs> that is one thing I don't think there is any shortage of that within our movement. <laughs> as far as giving gifts and taking and uh, receiving gifts is concerned, whenever there are appropriate occasions, we do, do we do that. But we will talk most about having exchanges. Uh, I met a devotee in uh, London. The devotee has now become a, he is a devotee, he is a prominent preacher, but he is also learning psychotherapy and he wants to uh, also serve the broader community as a psychotherapist. So he was telling me that often we talk about uh, that how there are so many mental health problems in today's world and so many people need to be a psych uh, visit psychologists. So he was telling me that people go to psychologists not because they are mad. Like we might use the word mad in a very extreme sense. Most of the time people go to psychologists because they want to unload. They want to unload. They are just so lonely and they want someone to whom they can speak. And especially someone who can hear them non-judgmentally. So, so, loneliness is a very big problem in today's world. And if we have affectionate relationships, then that loneliness will be countered because we will have someone with whom we can share. But if it is not there, then what may happen is that although we are in a devotee community, but if we have certain challenges, we have certain challenges, so there are certain things which we are going through, which are, we all have certain standards which you are expected to practice. And if you are not expect, if not able to follow those standards, for some reason, then, then we may feel, if I, if I talk this with someone, then people will look down at me. Therefore, I can't talk about this. And then we are struggling ourselves, but also we are struggling because we are not getting any help from others. So sometimes this, this our culture today itself is, to some extent, uh, isolating because life is so fast paced and we stay at various distances. The culture itself creates a lot of isolation. But on top of that, sometimes our, our adherence to, or ad, our attempt to adhere to high spiritual standards, that can create further isolation. Because of which we may, although we come together for festivals, we chant and dance and sing in kirtans, how much our hearts come closer to each other that we do not know. 
And Prabhupada says, and one of the seven purposes of ISKCON is to bring people closer to each other and closer to Krishna. It's interesting, not just closer to Krishna, closer to each other and closer to Krishna. So it's a, it's generally the closer we come to devotees, not in a sentimental sense, but in a deep devotional sense. That's why that what will happen is we will because that will be like a one more bond which will connect us with Krishna. So we have a vertical bond with Krishna by our sadhana bhakti, but our association with devotees are like bonds, horizontal bonds which are also connected with the vertical bonds. So to the extent we can have many, many bonds like that. We can move forward in our devotional life. So the idea of having six loving exchanges, of, of learning about loving exchanges is to deepen our connections with each other. Now, relationships is such a topic that uh, is, if there's one thing in this world which keeps us humble, that is relationships. <laughs> Just when we think we have got a hang of a particular thing, something happens. Do I know anything? Then now I understand this person. Now I know how to deal with them. And suddenly something happens. Hey, what happened? So actually relationships are what, to some extent, we keep learning throughout our lives. How to work in relationships. So I am by no means an expert in this. But I have been learning. And as I've been observing, interacting, studying scripture and trying to understand human psychology, especially psychology in a religious context. So I've learned a few things which I'll try to share. So I'll be doing this from three different perspectives. Uh, I'll just, this, this is the background. But, so we'll be primarily talking about some values, which I'll explain in this PowerPoint shortly. But along with that, I'll be talking about some pastimes from Chaitanya Charitamrit. And these values are not directly, it's not that for one value there will be one pastime. The pastime in an organic way reflects how Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had loving exchanges with his devotees. So depending on time, I'll talk about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's exchange with Sanatana Goswami and then Haridas Thakur and then with Rupa Goswami. We'll see how much detail we can go into each of these. But there we will see how the Lord is through each of his interactions, entering deeper into the hearts of these devotees. So, the six loving exchanges were what actually continued the Gauriya Vaishnava legacy after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu departed. And historians of religion say that actually Gauriya Vaishnavism was like an ideal system for disaster after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Why an ideal system, or a system means an ideal setup rather. Because normally whenever any, any, any leader departs, there is always a crisis of succession. How succession will take place from one generation to another. And normally for, to formalize and to make sure the process of succession happens, the leader does three things. They start an organization, they write some books and they name some successors. Otherwise, there can be chaos. In the case of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he did not do any of these three things. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu never started any organization. There was no official, like, like we have the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, we have Gaudiya Mat. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not start anything. So, there was no organization. Mahaprabhu did not write any books. So, what were his actual teachings? Otherwise, people can have conflict, you know, actually this is the right thing, this is the right thing, this is the right thing. So, he did not write any books. And on top of that, he did not officially name any successors. So, if you consider, if, say, if somebody starts a big company and they don't do any of they don't name a will, they don't have a will, they don't name successors, and they don't have any very formal structure also. So it can lead to chaos. So, the, so not only Gaudiya Vaishnavism survived, but it actually thrived and spread far and wide. How did that happen? It's primarily because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his legacy was primarily in the hearts of his disciples. So, 
how he deeply entered into the hearts of his devotees and through that he carried on the legacy and she saw shila prabhupada's mood also actually the spiritual legacy the tradition parampara is primarily a link of hearts it's a link of hearts it's not just a link of uh, institutional affiliation the institutional affiliation may be required at times but it's primarily a link of hearts so these so it is through loving exchanges that shri chaitanya mahaprabhu bound the hearts of his followers to him and that's how the the legacy continued in fact we see in the last almost 18 years of his life chaitanya mahaprabhu's life he did not travel much he is illured for 48 years so first 24 years he was in navadvip next 6 years he traveled next 18 years he was in puri and how how was he spreading his mission he was spreading his mission by inviting devotees to come there to to bring the to jagannath puri and there he was having very intense intimate loving exchanges with the devotees and that's how they he he at one level for the first 6 years he spread the movement by traveling taking it to many 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 people but later on he spread further by entering deeper and deeper into the hearts of his followers through the loving exchanges he had with them so that's the background can we who is operating this okay yeah, okay yeah go ahead so basically these are the three main values we'll be discussing not being non judgmental being sensitive and non judgmental the sensitivity and intimacy that means broadly speaking how others are what others are doing we don't be judgmental don't impose our way of looking at them then when we have to speak something we share our heart we share our concerns about them we share our concerns about ourselves we do it in a sensitive way and by that we'll have intimacy developing the three values which we'll try to learn over the next three sessions you go ahead and this is the for developing these values this is a point which we'll be falling back repeatedly on what does intelligence mean intelligence means to place things in the most constructive context in the most constructive frame of reference i'll explain what i mean by this but this is vital understanding this that placing things in the right frame of reference is vital for us to connect with people to understand what they are doing and prabhupada also in that bhagavad gita chapter defines intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective proper perspective so we all look at things from different perspectives and if our frame of reference and another person's frame of reference that two are very different then we just can't understand what is going on so we need to have some similarity in the frame of references so to i'll <clears throat> say a simple example of the frame of reference could be say in gaur leela when chaitanya mahaprabhu had manifested his devotion and one day he was just chanting the names of the gopis gopi 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 and he ch- chanting the word gopi chanting the names of the gopis and he is lost in ecstasy and he was living in a community with many brahmanas and most of the people over there were pious so generally we think of uh, there are three modes sattva rajas and tamas and generally we consider the lower mode like rajas and tamas to be filled with maya if we are in the low rajas and passion and ignorance we are in maya but actually sattva can also be a form of maya where people are pious and proud of being pious so most of the community in navadweep at that time was around jatama was pious and so brahmana was passing by he came to he saw chaitanya mahaprabhu and he heard him chanting gopi 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 and he went and started telling all the Bra- other brahmanas and in which shastra is it said that you should chant the chant gopi gopi we should chant the names of krishna so and they already had 
sudden annoyance with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because they felt that he was young but he was so charismatic and he had become so popular. So wherever he would go, he was so scholarly. First he had been scholarly, now he had become devotional. Both ways, as a scholar, he had outclassed them. And now as a devotee, he had so much personal spiritual magnetism that he attract so many people to him. So they already had some annoyance, some resentment. And generally, the more famous you become, okay, the, 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 just like in this world, there are dualities. There is, if there's happiness, there will be distress. So the more fame you get, the more criticism you become targeted by. So even the smallest fault, people will magnify it. And people will try to find fault. So now Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was so famous, so they were just looking for some reason to criticize him. They said, what is he doing? What, where is that said in Shastra? That you chant the names of the gopis. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was next to see. He's remembering the gopis, he's remembering the gopis' love for Krishna, Krishna's loving exchange with the gopis. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself is Krishna in the mood of Radharani. So especially he's personally experiencing the love of Radharani Krishna. So he was in ecstasy and later on when he came to know this Brahmanas are criticizing him, he, he felt exasperated by that. He said that these people will never understand. So he realized that as long as they are seeing him from that level, oh, he's just another Brahmana like us. We are Grahastha, he is Grahastha. And he said, I will not be able to communicate what I, to com what I need to communicate with them. So that small incident was one reason when he felt that I have to change the frame of reference. That I have to, I have to take sannyas. Then they will see me as a respectful, respectful sannyasi and then they will listen to what I am trying to say. So, what happened here, there's a... So, he was, his frame of reference was, oh, the gopis are exalted devotees of Krishna and they remembering them is remembering deep levels of love for Krishna. And the brahmanas were coming from another frame of reference. That was, oh, you have to follow Shastra. It's a strict letter of scripture. Where is the chanting of the name of gopis talking about? So, when you have two different frames of reference, one is looking for literal adherence to the letter of scripture. And the other is, is a sublime fulfillment of the purpose of scripture. So these two are very different frames of reference. And with these two different frames of reference, just there is no communication. I'll talk a little bit later about how frames of reference when they are different, it leads to problems of communication. But this is an example. You know, so if we want to communicate with someone, we need to understand what frame of reference they are coming from. So going ahead. Just those three values, we'll understand in these terms of reference now. Now, what does non-judgmentality mean? That we don't see others through our frame of reference, but rather we try to understand their frame of reference. Hmm? So, okay, why are you doing like this? So now, if those Brahmana, that Brahmana could ask him, instead of telling, criticizing everyone, you know, criticizing before everyone, he's just chanting the names of gopis. If he had asked, what are you doing? So, from his frame of reference, all that is always, he's a deviant. He's doing something which is not told in Shastra. So, don't impose your frame of reference on others. Don't see others through your frame of reference, but try to understand their frame of reference. So, how people are looking at, that we need to understand that. So, it's like say, uh, we are here, we are in two rooms, and say it's like a ni ni nice scenery we are having over here. But we are in these two rooms and we cannot talk directly with each other. But now we are seeing some scenery from one side of the, one, from our room window. They are seeing the scenery from their side of the window. Now because we are having two different perspectives, what we are seeing is different. I say, we might say from here, hey, can you see this beautiful peacock is there over here? Peacock? I can't see any peacock over here. He says, no, the peacock is there. And somebody says, there's a kangaroo, there's a kangaroo over here. I know there's no such kangaroo, kangaroo over here. What? I said, now, you are looking from different frames. So if we are in two different rooms with different windows, you would understand that, okay, we are seeing from different perspectives. So when we interact with people, basically, where, how does, how does, I'm not going to go in the direction of conflicts, 
because that's conflict resolution is a big subject we want to go where we have already have a relationship but we want to come closer in the relationship so the idea is when two people are looking from two different frames and then one person explains their frame to the other person and they understand oh this is how you're looking at it then our understanding expands oh you think like this and yeah that, that's one way of looking at it so when we can start seeing more and more from others frames of reference then that's when we start bonding with each other more and more the more what we see from each person's frame of reference varies the more there are likely to be disagreements the two frames of reference will never be identical that's impossible but the more the overlap the closer can be the mutual understanding and the less the overlap the greater will be the misunderstanding so first is non judgmentality means don't see others through your frame of reference but try to understand their frame of reference okay how are they seeing this why are they seeing like this the second is sensitivity that means if from if our frame of from our frame of reference what they are doing seems objectionable or we have some concern about that then speak it but speak it in a sensitive way don't just dismiss that you are doing something wrong okay from your frame of reference it seems right from my frame of reference it seems like this so convey our frame of reference in a gentle way that intimacy means as i said when both of us can see each other's frame of reference then we come close to each other so intimacy doesn't simply come by physical proximity it comes by by similarity of mind by when two people are like minded they can come together otherwise even there is great physical proximity still there can be a lot of alienation so broadly we'll be looking at this we'll be trying to understand our own frame of reference understand other people's frame of reference and try to see how we can bring this frame of reference closer and closer to each other so throughout this seminar i i if i i'll speak for probably say 10 15 minutes one or two points and then we will have pause and we'll have some reflections or questions so reflections means that you know any point that struck you any point you found oh this is very relevant for me or this is what i would like to share with others anything that struck you you could speak that it's not a question it's a reflection because that way you know when we hear the traditional it is in the shravan manan and nidhyasan shravan is we hear manan is we contemplate and nidhyasan is deeper contemplation for the purpose of application many times we hear classes and then we hear as soon as the class gets over then we start doing other things so we don't get time for reflection and deeper contemplation so the the whole purpose of reflection is in a retreat we don't want to rush through a lot of concepts we want to assimilate the concepts more and more so after every 10 15 minutes uh, especially if it's not a past time i'll stop and then we will have points for reflection so any reflections till now anything that struck you not a question right now reflection no i just want you to repeat something yeah please yeah alone 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 but yeah. like minded yeah no. yeah with yeah like mindedness like mindedness thank yes. you that what i made to point yeah thank you yes so any one or two point anybody would like to share anything that struck you maybe that you felt was relevant for you the point yes please Yes. Yeah. Please yes. get it. So, quickly. if you do speak to people in a non-judgmental attitude uh, and hear to them whatever they are saying, they are more comfortable to express to us what they are feeling, and we are also comfortable because they are not judgmental. We are also being judgmental. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. What happens is that if we are non-judgmental, then people lower their guards. Then they can open up more. Otherwise, if they are non-judgmental, then they they become defensive more and more. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 
That's true. There's so much of so many things that we can change in our lifestyles. So when you shake the hand, it's actually really hard to be non judgmental. You cannot train specifically to be non judgmental. That's true, yeah. I like the the way you explain the things of reference and how we can be non judgmental. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. You know, non judgmental, we all we don't want to be judgmental, but if we don't understand how we are being judgmental, it's very difficult to learn how to be non-judgmental. Yeah. This frame of reference is a very striking perspective. I'll explain this further. Yeah, thank you. Any one more point? Yes, one pro will come to you. Guru Gang. <laughs> Okay, Mother, you can speak, then we can go on to again. You can speak. Thank you so much for being on the platform. I think sometimes when people offer suggestions or you know sharing their thoughts honestly, the other person may think that they are trying to oppose or they are trying to argue. So it is very important to be non judgmental in accepting suggestions and advice from someone. Oh, okay. So we are taking from that other perspective, now. When we are give, when we are given advice, also we should not feel that we are being judgment. That the other person is being judgmental. I remember I was in I was in the Middle East at one place and I was counseling a family. So this daughter was telling that daughter and son they were there. That my parents are never satisfied with me. So, so I said, why do you feel like that? He says, no, we are very happy with her. We are proud of her. So I said that okay, you know, one day. He said that, so she was chanting some rounds and she chants, chanted some more rounds. So she told her mother that I chanted this many rounds. Mother said, good, I hope soon you will come to 16 rounds. So his mother said in the mood of encouragement, but she felt, she said, you didn't appreciate what I did, you simply imposed, when are you going to do this more? So what has happened for her perspective, she said, I did something and appreciated. Mother said, yes, I appreciate it, I encourage you to do more. But how we perceive even appreciation that also has to be sometimes we may perceive from our our own perspective so we need to be non-judgmental even in terms of uh, accepting appreciation that's an interesting point sometimes somebody speaks very sweetly with us we will start thinking what does this person want from me <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's good point thank you yes welcome <laughs> Yes, sure. Um, I, just, I, was just, I just wanted to appreciate the fact that you brought up frames of references because I find that with me, with my upbringing, because it's been very scientific in programming, that we tend to think there's one objective reality and we stop considering that there's multiple frames of reference. So in times of conflict, we stop considering that another person uh, may see it differently. It's just one thing happened and I see it the same way. This isn't evil. Like, you know. Yeah, excellent point. And with our scientific frame of reference, we we are trained to look at objective reality and that's true but there is an objective reality in terms of uh, say events or things but in terms of what those things mean to whom that is very subjective and that's why there are, that frame of reference is vital to understand i'll talk about this a little bit later when you know how things can be perceived objectively and subjectively Thank you. Very good point. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, so <coughs> I don't think it is on. You can speak. I'll repeat otherwise. Hare Krishna. Okay. Um, I like that uh, the idea of non I, my approach is when um, 
we want that something to happen. We always think in our frame of reference and want that to happen in our way. And then things, uh, when the things won't happen in our way, because everyone thinks in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens, uh, we sometimes we get angry. So of course, mm -hmm. I want it in this way, but you are doing it in this way. Okay, yeah, that's so, true. So with that, um, uh, what I notice is if we ask them their way of doing it instead of we see and then we, um, we perceive in our frame of reference and tell them this is what we do instead. What do you think? What do you think this can be done? How we can be done? So they explain in their way of frame of thinking. In that way, so we don't have to have the attachment to them. Hmm. So, so what happens? We lose attachment. Um, like uh, this, 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 my experience is my, with my kids. I want things to be done in my way of reference. And they say, or again, you don't know the way we work here. Yeah. I mean, they want it. Also. Yeah. So they think, this is not the way we need to We have to learn this. Okay, that is no problem. So my intention is you need to do this with this. If that is possible with your frame of reference, it's still okay. Mm -hmm. In that way, I can, I cannot be too attached to attached to activity, so it makes me free from the attachment. Okay, yes. So if we can help people, help see from others' frame of reference and see how a particular thing can be done from their frame of reference, then uh, we can get the thing done at the same time, not impose our frame of reference. Yeah, good point. That's why I said that, you know, we have to look at the most constructive frame of reference. Later on, I'll talk about, it's in, when it comes to frames of reference, it's not so much right and wrong. It is what is most constructive or what is most effective. I'll talk about how different frames of reference can work. At different levels, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thank you so much for bringing up non judgmentality in our team. This is a reflection, and I'm sure others would echo the same, uh, especially as a preaching movement when we welcome people from other backgrounds, I mean, not similar to the ones that we've brought up with. And quite often, as a part of them growing in the process of Bhakti, they're confronted with many of their conditioning. Mm -hmm. It happens quite often that when they try to seek shelter in, amongst the people who practice bhakti, that when we approach them or when they approach us, it's very important to have that non-judgmentality and especially that frame of reference because they'll be presenting a frame of reference which is based on their past conditioning and then we will present to them what we think is right and at times it could be a conflict and that kind of stops the sharing of heart. So, uh, yeah, it's a very important point. I would like to address this also. That, say, when people come from, say, some other religious or spiritual background and they come to Krishna, then sometimes we may, in a judgmental way, tell them this, that, that is wrong. And we need to be aware of their frame of reference. Yeah, so here, um, there are three different things, broadly speaking that there is being judgmental and there is being discriminating. Discriminating means it's actually required. Now the word discrimination has a neg negative connotation because racial discrimination, gender discrimination. But discriminating basically means the capacity to make distinctions. Say, and in any field of expertise, in any field expertise means the capacity to make distinctions. Say if somebody is a very good cook, and say somebody has made halwa. So somebody has made good halwa and somebody has made excellent halwa. So the difference is not very great. Somebody who is simply a, is like a glutton, they'll just eat halwa, very nice. But somebody who is a little kanezer, okay, this was made like this, this was made like this. So capacity to spot subtle distinctions is actually a sign of expertise. And in that sense, we can, in the name of being non-judgmental, we cannot be non-discriminating. So we do need to discriminate. Yes, if somebody has certain philosophical understanding which is not correct, or having they have some cultural practice which is not uh, not proper or whatever, 
we may need to tell them. So we, when we say non-judgmental, that doesn't mean, oh, we all have our frame of reference and everybody is in their frame of everything is all right. It's not relativism. It's not metaphysical relativism with everything is right. It's just that, so that's the first point. But second point is that when we want to tell someone uh, if something is wrong, we have to tell them in a way that makes sense to them. If we don't do that, then we will simply alienate them. I'll give an example for this. See, for most people, uh, people when they live in Rajas and Tamas, uh, then <coughs> anything even of Sattva, <coughs> even a little bit of Sattva gives them, makes them, gives them some relief, makes them feel good. And maybe that is their only inkling of something spiritual. See, most people talk, when they talk about spirituality also, they, they have no idea of what spirituality is. I was recently in, in I think, Gold Coast, so I gave a class on what is spirituality. So it's, it's a, it is, spirituality can refer to a, just a state of mind. People say, oh, this place is so spiritual. What do you mean? Oh, I feel so peaceful and nice when I come to the place. So spirituality is a state of mind. Hmm? then spirituality can also be a level of reality. That there is material and there is spiritual. And third is, spirituality can refer to practices that take, that connect us with that higher level of reality and also give us that peaceful, sweet state of mind. So, it can refer to, spirituality can refer to a state of mind, it can refer to a level of reality, it, and it can refer to practices that take us to that level of reality and provide the state of mind. So now, for most people, their idea of spirituality is state of mind. Oh, I feel so good when I go there. I go and do some deep breathing and I feel so good. Oh, I was in Singapore and one devotee said, one person, he said, I have been doing laughter therapy. So, oh, laughter therapy, you just go, to, this is go for a program and the whole program is laugh as loudly as you can. He said, I feel so good. This is the most spiritual experience I've had. Okay, now, the, what happens is, says from their frame of reference, spiritual means anything which makes me feel good. From our frame of reference, well, you're not connecting with soul, you're not connecting with Krishna, you're not experiencing, the, you're not rising to that higher level of reality. So what is spiritual about it? There's nothing spiritual. So we might dismiss it as being nothing spiritual. But, for them, it's a state of mind. For us, it's a level of reality which you want to go towards. So what happens is, for them, because they primarily think of it as a state of mind, and if anything makes them feel, feel peaceful, feel calm, feel clear, oh, I want to do this. So it's like somebody, it's extremely cold, and they have just got one thin, tattered sheet of cloth to protect them from the cold. And we, we want to give them a nice, thick, soft comforter. But we tell them, oh, you know, this sheet is thrown away. Now that is the only protection from cold they have. That is the only source of warmth they have. Even if that warmth is flimsy, but still that is all that they have. If we tell them to give it up, they will start thinking we are their enemies. Now, instead, we just give them the comforter. What happens? That means, give them an experience of Krishna. Let them come to a temple, let them come to some kirtan. Let, give them an experience of Krishna. And once they put on that comforter and they start feeling, oh, this is so good. And they themselves will think, I don't need, I don't need this sheet. And they will discard it. But sometimes our intention is to give people the comforter, but in giving them the comforter, we make them uncomfortable. <laughs> so throw that away. And not to throw that away, pull it away. We will start pulling it away from them. So we don't need to do that. So we do definitely want that they come to, they, if they have some incomplete or incorrect understandings, we want to correct them. But it is mostly people don't this is the third point I was going to make. So first is that it's in terms of like second is in terms of experience. For most people, it's experience that counts the most. And third point is that for most people, 
philosophy is not a major reason why they come to come to any spiritual path it is mostly various as i said community feeling good culture so many other things bring them to a particular path as a devotee in canada he had done some kirtan he went to that a place new he was stay, went to there and he stayed in a new place so he had a kirtan program and he invited his neighbors many of his neighbors came for the kirtan and then after that one of his friends had the one of the neighbors they had their own kirtan they were worshiping some they following some path where you know there are there are demigods and there are semi gods <laughs> semi gods is say me god <laughs> <laughs> i am god <laughs> so <laughs> some people claim i am god and this so there was this kirtan of this baba who was a who claimed himself to be god and this devotee was saying i don't want to go and do kirtan of some some god man like that but then he thought they called uh, we called them and they came how can i not go so he went there and when he went there at that time they did a little kirtan uh, like that but then he saw he said his son was a very good uh, good mrudanga player and he himself was a good singer so he said you sing something and he said you said sang sang play can play mrudanga he said no, actually no his son can also sing so he said but my son knows only krishna bhajans so okay let's do krishna bhajans so for five ten minutes they did that uh, that god man's bhajans but after that next one hour it was all krishna kirtan so for most as we that is a it's a program mostly for indians but in general the indians are more interested in worship than the object of worship <laughs> you want to come and do some kirtan who is kirtan is immaterial <laughs> sometimes some people come to a temple and they fold their hands and pray so sincerely in front of the deities so sometimes i feel i don't pray to deities so sincerely so once it happened when i was in pune long ago this person they prayed so sincerely and then when they were going out i was just uh, outside and said this is asking me who is there on the altar <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the point i'm making over here is that you know, philosophy is not a major reason why people choose a spiritual path and that's why philosophy is not a major obstacle also people might be having some other philosophical understanding now when they come to krishna they their wrong philosophy may not obstruct them as much as our saying that their philosophy is wrong <laughs> their wrong philosophy may not obstruct them as much as our saying that their philosophy is wrong and this is wrong you know such a great saint has said it's a great spiritual teacher has said how can you call it wrong so if we just give them the right understanding gradually they'll accept it and for them it is if they get a positive experience of krishna bhakti they will keep moving forward so being non judgmental is not being sentimental or relativistic and expect accepting everything but trying to understand what makes them tick so if it for most people it is their experiences that make them tick and then if we can provide them better experiences then they will come to krishna so it's very important to be uh, at one level not be sentimental and say everything is all right but not judgmental and just dismissing people's previous experiences rather we acknowledge their experiences and we if we can offer them a better experience then they will surely come to krishna okay thank you yes you had a point Yeah, right. And then we chose to together and to work together. So, that's true. Yeah, exactly. And we have to work in a team and we are all volunteers. So if you don't feel inspired, we will not be 
we will not contribute much. So we definitely need to, we can't necessarily accept everyone's frame of reference, but at least we acknowledge it. So then devotees feel, uh, feel like participating. See, if there is no involvement, there will be no commitment. I was going to come to this principle later, but I'll just mention it now. That if there is no involvement, if somebody doesn't feel, I, I'm involved in this, that I'm included in this, that my voice is heard, my contribution is value. If there is no involvement, then there will be no commitment. So that involvement comes by accepting. Yeah, that's, that's also one way of looking at things. We don't necessarily say that is the way we will all look at it. But we acknowledge that's also valid. At the same time, right now we are going to look at things in this way. So it's important that we give people a sense of involvement. And acknowledging their frame of reference is one very uh, valuable way to help people feel validated. Okay. Can you go ahead? So I'll speak a lot on its frames of reference. I think you have to go behind one minute. Let's go back. I'll talk about this a little bit. See, <clears throat> frame of reference means that see every situation that we are in, it can be interpreted in different ways. See, <clears throat> if uh, we are in a room and suddenly the light goes off, now we could say, oh, did somebody accidentally press the switch? Because the light went off. So we are seeing an effect that light has gone off. So we could put it in that frame. So has somebody accidentally switched it off? Switch off the bulb. We should have turned off the switch. Or has that bulb gone off? It's got spoiled. If that is not there, then maybe that is there. If that is not there, do we have a master switch in the house? Has somebody accidentally switched off the master switch? If that is not there, then has the power supply itself gone on in our locality? We may ask our neighbors or someone. Beyond that, we may ask, oh, if, oh has the power, power, power plant itself shut down because of some reason? Broken down because of some reason? Or you could say, maybe some terrorists have attacked and they have destroyed all the power plants in the country. And power has broken down. And what happens is, we could, now, it's not that any of these is wrong. Even that, that extreme thing which you're saying, the power, a terrorist attack, stopping all power in the country, that's also possible. In fact, you can go even further. There's a phenomena called solar flares. You know, A, from the sun flares come out. And the, the solar flare comes very close to the earth. Then, because of the solar flare's energy, all electric and electronic appliances in the earth will shut down. And, I think it was three or four years ago, it happened in Canada, that the solar flare went very close to Canada. And for a few minutes, there was national outage. So that is how when our, our light goes off, there is a solar flare in the sun. You know, who is going to think about that? But think, we live in an interconnected universe and things can be escalated to different levels. Now, which is the functionally effective level? That's what we have to find out. So normally we could say, in this case, we go from smaller to bigger to bigger to bigger. Okay, has the switch gone off? Has, this, has that, device, that bulb itself gone off? And then we go bigger and bigger. So, now it's not that one or other is right, it's just that which is the most effective. And all of us, based on our tendencies, we might choose a particular, we might default towards a particular frame of reference. And then, our frame of reference will determine our response. So let's look at an example and then uh, I'll give various responses that could be there and then you can tell me what is the frame of reference over here the person is having. Can you go ahead? Can you go ahead? So suppose we are going to for a meeting, we, we, we are going for a meeting someplace and then when we go to that meeting, that person doesn't, we are supposed to meet someone, that person doesn't come on time. So now these are four different responses. So that person is saying, he's so unpunctual. That's one response. Other response could be that, you know, no, that I'm in this service, no one understands the importance of this service. A third could be that everyone takes me for granted. Now, but fourth could be that, you know, whatever I do, nothing ever works smoothly. So now, if you see, can you identify what is the first frame of reference? 
broadly speaking it's judging the other person okay that that person is late that's true now what are we doing from this incident we are extrapolating this person is un unpunctual so it's it's the other person centered perspective now it's not wrong i'm just giving an example for the frame of reference is that the our frame of reference centers on the other person the second is centered on what service it is centered on service you know it is service centered you know this is not service centered in the necessarily positive, not service attitude centered it is saying that you know, nobody take this service seriously nobody values this so it is we are looking at it from a service perspective say we have we come we have the temple there is some vessel washing or some temple hall temple maha cleaning and we get there and nobody has come over there so it's people not taking the service seriously that could be one way of looking at it the third is what yeah we, we are taking it personally you know I, i i told you to come and you didn't come so it's not just about you we are putting it to person you know, nobody takes me seriously everybody takes me for granted so it it is something which is about how people relate with us so first is that person's character judgment second is that service judgment third is you know our our relational judgment and the fourth is fourth is like we are judging about our whole life nothing in my life works so you see the, the, the same incident but you can have so many different references i was in connecticut i was giving a seminar uh, there <coughs> the connecticut government had organized something like spirituality and mental health so i was speaking from the bhakti yoga perspective so they were talking about people who had gone to depression and there some of those people are also speaking so i was speaking with one girl afterwards and she was telling that she was studying in a uni and along with that she was also uh, doing a job to get some money by the side so she was uh, waiting tables in a hotel and she was once carrying a glass of water to a client and their glass of water slipped from her hands and it fell down and he says she said that triggered the depressive episode in me she said if i can't carry even a glass of water what am i ever going to do in my life and that set her off in depression now how many from how many of us a glass of water slipped from our hands isn't it for almost every one of us for once it happened to be i was giving a class and i drank water and somebody asked a very surprising question <laughs> so that surprise was over that the glass slipped from my hand <laughs> so at least everybody woke up after that <laughs> nobody stayed asleep when that happened <laughs> but anyway so we all have had a glass slipping from our hands but now what has happened what she did was that she, a small incident a glass of water slipping from the hands it just gave it the the largest possible implication that is i can't do anything right in my life now the when we take the smallest of incidents and give it the largest of implications that can be very unhealthy at times so usually for people who are inclined who are depressed who get depressed this is what is happening they when things go wrong in their life small incidents they 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 put them in the very big references and that's how they become dysfunctional so but i just give this example to illustrate how as one small incident could be put in very different frames of reference now this is with respect to uh, how one person perceives themselves and perceives things happening to them now let's look at another example of how a small difference of opinion or small conflict can escalate wildly because of varying frames of reference can you go ahead a same situation so b doesn't come on time for a meeting with a and finally when they come then what does a say first thing what does it can read it out you are never on time you are never on time now what has a done a has taken that from an incident it's made a judgment about you and then immediately b says b also takes from the incident and generalizes what is b generalization you are always nagging me 
So now what has happened? The issue is forgotten and it's become direct personal attacks on each other. You are never on time and you are always nagging me. And then, now, he says, you, know, you never hear what I'm saying. He says, you are judging me and you condemn me. You, you never hear. I, I told you came late, you're not even hearing me. So another attack on it. You never hear what I'm saying. And now what happens? Can you go ahead? So A says, you never hear what I'm saying. And then B starts thinking, why am I even working with you? I don't even know what I ever saw in you. You are such a pain. Now, this is actually a very painful statement to hear. Somebody is like, you are such a pain. I don't know what I ever saw in you. And it becomes a, it's not just an attack, it's an even more personal attack. To say that you are unpunctual, to say that you are a knack, that's painful. But here what is happening, we are coming closer and closer. So it's like when we cut, if somebody cuts hair, because hair doesn't have any nerves, so cutting it doesn't cause pain. But whenever a cut is done, the closer it comes to the nerve, the more painful it becomes. It's like sometimes the tooth has to be extracted or tooth root canal has to be done. So sometimes you can just go deep into the tooth and there's no pain. But sometimes you just go little into the tooth, if there's a nerve over there, ah, the person will scream almost. So what happens is, here both people are attacking each other and they're cutting closer and closer to the nerve. So you are, you nag me, that's one thing. But to say you are such a pain, that's even more of a personal attack. It cuts too close to the nerve. And then what happens? Mm -hmm. you how dare you attack me? How dare you accuse me like this? He says, I am not going to work with you. So you are going towards a breakdown in the relationship itself. And then the other person says, who are you to not work with me? I, I kick you out. And it's like, just from one incident of being late, where it go? You know, this is broken down completely. So it's all. So the first is you are never on time. So okay, instead of that, from now, from your frame of reference, it's true that person didn't come on time. But maybe there was, maybe there was traffic. Maybe there was some crisis. We don't know why they are late. So without understanding the frame of reference, when we judge, you are never on time. Now maybe that person just came from a. Maybe they, in their family they had an emergency and they somehow managed to come after they are already very burdened. And you tell them you are never on time. And actually the other person says, you are always nagging me. At least I came, I had so much difficulty. So when we just insist on our frame of reference and the other person insists on their frame of reference, then small issues can lead to huge conflicts. Small issues can lead to huge conflicts. Uh, one of my friends in America is a is a like a marriage counselor. So he was telling me that many times when people separate, sometimes they separate for the for what can seem like the trivialest of reasons. So he said that there was one woman. She came and she said, no, "I want a divorce." He says, "What happened?" He says, so they, "They were living together and they 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 they, they, they were they married together and they both had their own cars." And he said, my husband took my car without my permission. How dare he do such a thing? And he says, because of that you want to divorce? He says, no, he always takes me for granted. He takes everything of mine for granted. So the issue, this, you know, if somebody is urgent, urgently, they take the other person's car. That's not something to break the relationship down. But what has happened is, see, when certain events happen, based on the, the other person's frame of reference, what meaning they are ascribing to it. The meaning they are ascribing is, you don't, you take me for granted, you don't value me. You presume that everything, that I am just there for you. So, each person, if we understand their frame of reference, then we will understand that certain thing may be very, very important for them. But if we don't understand their frame of reference, from our frame of reference, yeah, okay, it's to be done, but it's not very important. But from the other person's frame of reference, that may be extremely important. Now, if we understand the other person's frame of reference, for us to do that thing may not be very difficult. We can do it if we put a little bit of effort, but just because we don't understand their frame of reference, we don't understand that it's important. So, small conflicts can escalate to huge proportions if the frame of reference is not understood. 
and conversely if the frame of reference is understood small changes can actually bring big positive positivities in the relationship in the small changes if we do the interactions can become much smoother so because from the frame of reference a particular thing might be very important and we understand why that is so important so this is about <coughs> this frame of references and how to apply it in various perspectives any reflections on this yes please yeah here at the shop and if i'm on uh, i don't know it's, it's a real mistake or so, something so whatever i am great i want to share so this man has got an expensive car and then he is washing the car and then with this uh, kit and then kit really she doesn't know the value of the car because she is a kid and then what she did is she started writing on the car it's an expensive car and she started making a scratch and he got so annoyed because it's such an expensive car he is so angry and he will hit that kid with, a, with his hammer or something and the hand broke and then they rushed the hospital and everything and then after um, some time he came and wanted to check the car and then she, he realized that what she was written is I love my dad and then he felt so annoyed and because she wanted to express she doesn't, doesn't know with her frame of reference she don't know the value of the car and she wanted to express uh, her feelings and then he didn't know and uh, he thinking if she's spoiling the car so um, unless we try to understand what they want to express their frame of reference Conflict, my, my god not just a conflict completely misunderstand even the best of intentions that's very and sad yeah thank you for sharing you else yes, uh, about the sensitivity point so where you said uh, we have is that on it's about the sensitivity point where you mentioned if you are not sensitive to other person's frame of reference then it might cause issue whereas if you try to understand where they are coming from both perspectives might be right so we need to understand the most important frame of reference and mm -hmm. go by it yeah most constructive i wouldn't say the most important because sometimes there might be a bigger issue also to be dealt with but right now which is the most constructive what is the what is the way we can move forward right now the bigger issue will your that frame of reference is also important but we can't deal with it right now let's deal with it later so that's it most constructive yes thank you yes please very valid point what happens is so i'll elaborate on this a little bit thank you for bringing this up that sometimes we have just too many things to do and then we don't consider people and their frames of reference at all and we get things done but we are not satisfied others are also not satisfied and we now what happens is that we we pursue things at different levels like no one was saying about subjective and objective I would say that not more than more than subjective objective is like we have a low resolution conception of things and a high resolution conception of things. Say for example, first time we buy a car, and the car itself is so special. Then 
when we drive in the car we think oh i have my car i am owning the car and then we look at we want everybody else to see the car so the car is in the focus of our consciousness but if we have we have been had a car for a long time and then we are driving a car then we, when we get into the car the car is just something which will get us where we want to go so at that time the car is there in our consciousness but it's a very low resolution uh, conception that it just a tool for me to come from here to there but when the car breaks down then oh then we have to focus on the car okay this is the machine and i don't know anything about the machine now i have to i have to get a get a mechanic or i have to take it to the mechanic and then we have to fix it and then so what happens suddenly that resolution zooms up i know so little about it i don't know do i know enough so that the mechanic was not going to cheat me and swindle me of a lot of money so based on based on the situation for functional purposes because we have so many things to do so we have a we can our brain has finite capacities so while while functioning we have low resolution conception of things and that's required so similarly while functioning we have we get a low resolution conception of people also that <coughs> a low resolution conception of people means that okay if we are doing some service then this person is meant to do a b c d e this person is a person who will do this 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 so we reduce people to the tasks that they are meant to do and at a, at a functional level it's required if we are doing a major responsible thing then uh, then to to consider that those thing that is to be done it's it's from functional perspective that is the only way we can function but we cannot have always that low resolution functional conception of people there's a time when our focus has to shift to them if a high resolution low resolution conception means people are simply agents to get things done a high resolution conception is that people are conscious beings with their emotions their perspectives their ideas their dreams their hopes so so there so with respect to why a car we we go into that high resolution only when the car breaks down similarly with people also it's only when the relationship are breaking down then we shift from the low resolution to high resolution when somebody when uh, but instead of doing that if we can recognize that there is there are you know there can be that we can say that there are interactions with each other they can be transactional and they can be transformational transactional means okay i do this you do this and we'll get this done that's just transactional basis so if we go to a shop and buy something we tell i want this and they give it to us so there are experiments which have been done that when people go to a uh, go to a shop and you know they they give their bill and they give the uh, give the bill and then they give the bill to the person and the person enters something on the computer and then what they did is was that is experiment was that while the person was waiting at the counter to you give the list of items and they give us the you give the money and then they give the bill back during that time they had the person change over there like that person would just go down to the chair and somebody else would come and sit over there and it's almost like out of 10 people eight people would not even notice so it's not that that person has got some change the person has changed so you give the you give the list of items or the, to someone and then the person who gives you money is different but we have a very low resolution low resolution conception of that and there's somebody who will clear the bill so we don't even notice it so now because our life is fast so we tend to have this low resolution conception of people and functionally it may be necessary but especially in our close relationships or relationship that we want to make closer we cannot function with a low resolution conception that will lead to dissatisfaction frustration and then eventually collision and sometimes at that time if we go to a higher when there is a collision happening there is a breakdown happening then going to higher resolution it's much more complicated because already so many wounds have been uh inflicted so if we can create regular periods of time when 
we focus on the relationship itself. That means we focus on interacting with each other. So we have a high resolution conception. Now I was at a, uh, at a project where there are many devotees who are working together and all of them are equals. So what happens if there is a hierarchy, then if there is one person who, who is respected, then if there are conflicts, you just resolve it, talk with each other. That is just what that person says, we all accept it. Even if some people are dissatisfied, we accept the authority. But when equals are working together, it becomes more difficult. So they have devised a system that every fortnight, there are four people who are the pioneers, there are four uh, main people in the project. So that's, they, husband, wife, all eight of them, they say they come together once every fortnight or at the most once a month and they come and just discuss Krishna Katha. It's not that one person gives a class, it's everybody speaks for five, five minutes. And then others give, give, share some points also. So the idea is when we are working together as a managerial team, then what happens? We inevitably get a transactional view of each other. Or oh, this person is in charge of accounts, it's always so stingy. That doesn't sanction anything. It's always such a pain in the neck. Hmm? Somebody is in some other position of authority. See, you know, this person is always so domineering. But when we come together just for discussing Krishna Katha, then what happens is we get a high resolution. When we hear that other person speaking about Krishna, speaking about their inspiration, speaking about uh, uh, speaking about things which have nothing to do directly with their transactional role. Then what happens? We get a more high resolution picture of them. And then, okay, this person is also a devotee of Krishna. I am also trying to be a devotee of Krishna. And let us all work together. So we need to, especially in our important relationships, have forums where we can have that high resolution, high resolution uh, pitch conception of others. Otherwise, with that low resolution conception, we will, things will go towards a breakdown. We can't avoid that low resolution conception, but we can't have that alone all the time. Okay? Thank you. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, for a devotee, please, uh, can we raise scenarios in which the place of reference can be written? Because uh, devotee, a uh, parent, devotee, a uh, son, a uh, devotee, a husband, he has, he's working in a, in a company of a large serve. His relationship with his peers, relationship with his bosses, of course, both of them are different. There is relatives who are non devotees. Mm -hmm. So these things of trust will be changing, right? So how do we, you know, change the problem for a devotee? So can you okay. explain those aspects? So if there are, as a devotee, we are all in different roles. And each role may require a different frame of reference. Yes, they basically we can say the frame of reference. So there is, we talk about attachment and detachment. So now there can be attached in Sattva Guna. Often, see in Tamoguna, in, Raj, in Rajoguna, there is attachment to possessions and positions. Mm -hmm that you know, this is the position I want, this is what I own, I want to hold on to it. In Tamoguna, the attachment is basically to escape ways. <laughs> and how can I escape from difficulties? Everything that can give me a positive escape, whether it is intoxication or escapist entertainment or whatever. In Sattva Guna, the attachment is to opinions. Opinions. Now this is, so I am so intelligent, I am so learned, my way is right. So it is, it actually, in Sattva Guna, when the attachment to opinions comes up, that, that's why, you know, the, there are, it said that if there are seven rushis, Nasa rushi jasse matam na bhinnam. So if there are seven, seven rushis, they will end up being eight opinions. Not just seven opinions, eight opinions. <laughs> Because somebody is, they argue and while arguing they just shift from one opinion to another opinion just to maintain. And some people say, yeah, my opinion might be wrong, but the fact that I am right is still true. <laughs> <laughs> so some people just become very attached to their opinions. So in Sattva Guna that, that problem comes up 
that our attachments are not gross, they are subtle. So, for a person, Sattva Guna, they don't have that much attachment to wealth and positions, and they, 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 say, they may say, I'm detached. But you know, actually, every mode will bring its own challenges. So, in Sattva Guna, the detachment is actually, okay, maybe my opinion is not right. I'll be talking about that later about opinions. That, you know, the willingness to examine our own opinions. That is the detachment that is required for sattva, sattva, in Sattva Guni person. That is challenge. So for us, with respect to our particular way of functioning, we need to recognize that the frame of reference, frame of reference also is related with our opinion. This is how things should be, this is how things should not be done. We are coming from a frame of reference. So, so there is psychological rigidity and there is psychological flexibility. Psychological rigidity means we can see things only in a particular way. Psychological flexibility means we can see things in different ways. So in Sattva Guna, the challenge is not so much detachment from possessions, but detachment from opinions. And that comes, that, that's what is psychological flexibility. So the idea is that with different people, we need to understand how they function and and function appropriately with them so i was with one devotee a, i was asking one senior devotee sometimes and i was there a class and one, one devotee was being asked senior devotee was being asked sometimes with some people our wavelength just doesn't match so what do you do so that senior devotee answered that humility means you change your wavelength so that it matches <laughs> Now, it's not always easy to do that. But at least we take the initiative. So, depending on how a particular person is, uh, is inclined or disposed, we need to function differently. So, if somebody, <coughs> say the way we talk with our family at home will be different from the way we talk at office. Mm -hmm. And in the office we may have to push and get things done. Now, some people, you, know, you some people actually, Unless they are pushed, they don't do anything. And some people, if they are pushed, they stop doing everything. So if they pushed, if you if you don't push them, the people are you know a little bit in the tamaguna, they have to be pushed again, reminded again and again. But some people, if you keep pushing them, he says, you don't trust me. I told you I'll do it. I'll do it. If you don't trust me, then I'm not going to do it. So if you push them, they will not do it. So we have to read people a little bit, and according to our role, we may have to function. So it's not so rather than thinking of uh, the frame of reference as something which is rigid and fixed to us, we see that as a tool for getting our service done. So whatever be our service, so I was I was speaking in Intel. So there, Intel in America in uh, Silicon Valley. So there, uh, one person was one day I, I was speaking about. Humility. So one devotee is saying, humility is not practical in the professional setting. So you can't be humble over there. He said, one what, what, what of my friends is an I am. So he said that we are trained to see everything in terms of building our resume. So he was telling a joke they have. He says, if your tap is on and if you turn off the tap, he says, I helped, I am an active agent in conserving water on the planet. <laughs> I'm an activist. <laughs> so you take the smallest of things and expand it. So sometimes when we write our CV, we build our profile, it's all like blowing our trumpet. You have to do that. Now that may be required for a functional purpose. But ultimately, why do we want a job? That we want so that we have financial stability, so that we have social position, so that we can serve Krishna. So if for a particular role, a particular mode of functioning is required, we can take that without becoming attached to that, without necessarily making that our default mode of function. But even in, in, even in, even in a professional setting, humility in terms of, uh, humility may not be exhibited the same way we might exhibit it. But there also, in a professional setting, if you want to have work, work as a team player, the humility is required. If somebody else gives a suggestion, then to just listen to their suggestion, not dismiss it. And if some, even if somebody junior gives a suggestion, if they are a good suggestion, accepting it, that requires humility. So the way we might express humility in a devotee context might be different from the way we express humility in a professional context. 
but humility as a virtue is always applicable so we have to adjust according to our according to our particular role uh, what frame of reference we adopt because that we see the frame of reference as a tool for serving krishna so for some people like earlier talking about some people are just like fix it I mean, they they just want to get things done i remember once i came to a temple and i was staying there for a few, uh, some time so one devotee came and told me that he was one of the managers he said you know if you have anything to, if you want anything done come to me if you want to talk go to that person <laughs> So I don't, I don't I don't have time to talk with him. <laughs> so I was a little taken aback, but I was happy at least he clarified. This is what I can do. This is what I can't do. So for some people, it is just fix things. You know, one, two, three, four, five. If from them we expect, oh, you should sit and talk with me. That's not going to happen. So we will also for those people just adopt that attitude with them. Let's get things done. So the other people, we can spend more time and. Uh, they like to talk they like to talk and discuss we talk, we cannot talk and discuss so we have to be, we have to have that psychological flexibility okay. thank you Any other points yes sir i was relating uh, the frame of response to personalities so a depressive personality is probably someone who sees things more from the other person other person's frame of reference while an oppressive personality is the opposite, where you see things from your own frame of reference and you try to impose your frame of reference on the other person. Uh, what a second frame of the personality is it? Depressive. Oppressive and? Depressive. Repressive. Depressive. 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 Okay. So a depressive person may find okay. someone who okay. sees things too much from the other person's frame of reference and understands the other person's. Uh, you know, where they are coming from, to this extent that they don't, they're not, they're not aware of their own, and an oppressive okay. person implies, Good point, yeah. okay, oppressive meaning someone who is more conscious of, you know, their own frame of reference, and is trying to impose that on, on the people around them. Uh, That's true. And, yeah, it's a, it's a good point, you know. Yeah. You want to add something? Yeah. Yeah, I think I have a related question as well, that ego situation is, um, is not very conducive uh, yes. to the individual and to the situation, and hence, I don't know, <laughs> I need an answer. That's true, yeah, I got it. Well, so, is it that, say, depressive people just think too much from the other person's perspective and they, they let themselves be pushed around because of that, and oppressive people, personality? This imposes their own perspective too much. Yeah, it's possible. Now, depression itself is very complex. And I would say that uh, we have to see each person, if they get depressed, why they're getting depressed. But broadly speaking, what you say could be true. You know, we have our individuality. And when you say we can try to understand our frame of reference, that doesn't mean we deny our frame of reference. We have to acknowledge our individuality and our personality also. So broadly, we could say there are three ways of functioning. There is passive, which is broadly in tamoguna. Now, whatever anyone does, we just, we just are totally, we just go along with that person without any opinion or any stand of our own. Now you do want, whatever you want, we just go along with that. Now that will eventually make us feel suppressed. So we, if we think only from the other person's perspective and just do whatever they want us to do, then that is, we are denying our own individuality. So being passive is not very good. That is in tamas, in the mode of ignorance. Being aggressive is in the mode of rajas, is rajas. Basically, you no, know, we just impose our way alone. Now, I, and this is the way it is to be done, my way or the highway, like that. Now, sattva is characterized by being assertive. Assertive means that I am ready to change in some areas, but there are some things which are important for me and I, I will stand up for them. So if we don't stand up for the things that, that are important for us also, eventually we will feel choked. Eventually we will not be able to function. So we need to be assertive. And that's why in Sattva Guna, it's important to recognize which things are worth standing up for, which things are worth fighting for. Now, it's not that when we have close relationships, we may not fight with each other, we may not argue with each other, we may still argue. 
but there is a core foundation to the relationship and then certain things which I am ready to change but certain things I am not ready to change. So we need to be we need to move towards assertiveness and we can't just give in to everything that the other person is saying but and we can't also impose everything that we are saying. We have to recognize that there is give and take and things which are more important for me I need to persuade the other person so that they can understand why this is important this has to be done this way and things which are important for the other person we also acknowledge and we are ready to bend in those areas. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Yes. Sir. You are looking at the? The language. Yeah. So there is a very generalized thing so it's like always, like yeah. always made, you know, never listen to me or you're going to be You may take that one scenario and that one example and just say, you know, something like that. Um, and I was just thinking about how when we're trying to be non-judgmental, how um, or sensitive, how important the language is. Um, because in, in spirit, when we want to be non-judgmental, but because of how we, we, we all have a Yes, very important point. Thank you. You know, sometimes our language can hurt people much more if we are not not careful about the language. We may be non-judgmental, we may be affectionate, but we don't convey it to others. Yeah, actually, people don't know what is in our hearts. Basically, we learn, like I said, what is in the heart, we infer. And how do we infer? Broadly, by their actions and by their words. And it's not just by their actions and words with us, by their actions with others which we come to know, by their words with others about us which we come to know later. So especially if we use absolute words, never, always, that means for that person it's like, it's, it's, a, in, in, a, it's in a court, suppose you know, somebody has accused us of something and we are going to the court. And by the time we reach the court, the judgment has already been passed and we have been convicted. He says, you never give me a chance to speak. No, you are already convicted. So, when we use the language of never, it's like there is no chance for appeal. Never. It's absolute language means we have already passed the judgment. So, then that person becomes, feels very resentful because of that. So, it's in writing, when I was studying writing, one says, always be suspicious about absolute statements. And don't be suspicious about this absolute statement. <laughs> because always be suspicious about absolute statements. This is also absolute statement, because it's always. But don't be suspicious about this statement. <laughs> so, in general, absolute statements are not true. They're always nuances. So, it's good if we can learn them. Okay, so last two, yes, you want to say something more? Just one last one. Yeah. There's a book written by Dean Krishnamaya called Empathic Communication. Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful book. Yes, so he talks about how we can learn the language of empathic. Yes, so Dean Krishnamaya has written a book on empathic communication, realizing our empathic nature. So there is there's a principle, there's a concept called nonviolent communication, which is quite uh, popular in mainstream. Mm -hmm mainstream communication theory. So he has adopted this principle and he has written this book. It's, it's a very nice book for devotees to read and appreciate and apply. Thank you. Yes. So should we stop here? Yes. So whatever comments you have, we can continue in the next session. Was it a comment, a question? What is it? Can we continue? You want to do it now or? Yes. You can't say no to her. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
That's a valid judgment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what does um, all of this just means we have to be so on the alert all the time. What am I saying? What am I doing? And we're constantly analyzing. What part is spontaneity playing on this? Because if you're not spontaneous, then you might just lose that moment. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a good question. So, you know, if we are to be always so analytical, what we are speaking, what other person is thinking, then how can, can we not be spontaneous? Yes, definitely there is a room for spontaneity in relationships. And in fact, um, where there is close relationship, that is where we can be ourselves the most. It's like, say, if you are in office, you, know, you are going to be formal. The way we dress, the way we talk, the way we conduct ourselves. Even when we are outside, we'll be formal. But if we are at home, then we can be more informal. We can talk casually, we can maybe dress casually. So, so many things we can do more informally at home. So now that's because we are at home. So similarly, when we are close to someone, then we can express ourselves spontaneously. Because there is a basic platform of trust. There's a basic platform of trust and understanding. Mutual understanding is there. So if that is not there, then we need this. If, of course, this is always useful, but it's not that we have to always be conscientious in terms of extremely guarded with everything we speak. To some extent, being guarded is required because at one level, Sattva Guna means that we are cautious about our speaking. Some people speak to express their thoughts. And then some people speak to discover their thoughts. <laughs> so, now, that's okay. Some people speak that. I didn't mean to say that. It's like a slip of tongue. So, some people are by their nature more spontaneous. And that if that's the way we are, then that's fine. We can't suppress ourselves. Other people also understand after some time. You know, like some people say, yes, I know some people, I hate this. And then after five minutes, they are doing that very thing. So it's like just a, it's just a way they speak that, they express their displeasure in a very strong way. But after that, they do the thing. So it's like, if, if some people are very spontaneous, and that's their default nature, other people will also understand that after a period of time. That this is the way this person functions. And if you want to speak, I don't have to take it very seriously. But in general, there is a time and a place where there is a, it's like we are at home. If this particular person, we are already at home, very, very close to each other, then we can lower our guards and just be spontaneous. But even with people with whom we are spontaneous, sometimes there are some issues which are some issues which are tense, which need to be about which we need to be guarded about. So we could we could see this these as tools to use when necessary. So it's not that we always have to be on guard with and we can never be spontaneous. There are places and people with whom we can be spontaneous. But these are tools which can use at on many occasions, including with people we are close to when we are dealing with some high stake issues. Okay. So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki, Gaur Bhakta Vanda Ki, Thai Gaur Premanande. Hare Krishna. Thank you for such beautiful